Okay, we'll get underway and we'll just go to the, the next slide. And, um, so good afternoon, colleagues. I'm Mark Purcell from ACFID and I'm joined by Jocelyn Condon, our COO, and Emily Morton, who's our Code and Standards Lead. And we're really pleased that you could uh, join us today for this briefing on changes to the only standard for international development uh, that exists in Australia, the ACFID Code of Conduct. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, who are the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in Canberra today, but also acknowledge uh, traditional owners, First Nations people in the lands that you're meeting in uh, or coming in from. Um, we acknowledge that the country faces a very important choice about the nature of our reconciliation and recognition of sovereignty and consultation uh, with the vote on the voice coming up in the referendum. Um, and we hope all of us exercise that choice wisely uh, for the good of our nation. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, today, we're going to go through uh, the background to what has been a very comprehensive uh, review of ACFID's Code of Conduct, which occurs every five years, uh, and it's managed by the Code of Conduct Committee, uh, very uh, adroitly chaired by Alan Cameron, the chair of uh, the committee, uh, in consultation with ACFID's board. Uh, we will explain the summary of amendments and changes to the code based on the consultation uh, that we've run with our members, uh, you, and also we will explain how we're gonna go about implementing those amendments. But before we get underway, uh, just to the next slide, uh, just to say that uh, the ACWID code from my perspective matters greatly uh, for three reasons. The first is because it embodies good practice that has been arrived at in a whole range of areas by charities operating internationally and making important interventions into other people's jurisdictions and cultures. And so in, in that practice, there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of tears. And so there is actually a lot of learning uh, that comes about from the work of international development that is embodied in ACFID's code. So that's the first point that it, it, it actually captures the collective wisdom and this review process has done that yet again through a very consultative process. The second point is that uh, this code is actually recognised by uh, the government in Australia. So if you look on the ACNC website, the Charity Regulator, you can see a comparison with their external governance standards, but also the ACFID code. It's recognised as one of the prerequisites for the ANCP, the main funding program. Uh, for, by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's also recognised by AUSTRAC and generally by regulators internationally as a excellent standard of practice for charities operating internationally. And I think the evidence of that was when there was uh, the safeguarding scandal some years ago in the UK in international development and there were parliamentary inquiries uh, and the like and a lot of negative media coverage uh, ACFID was able to work with members to do independent reviews of safeguarding practice, quickly identify measures that could be incorporated into the existing architecture, work closely with the government, the Australian government, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to align uh, with measures and inform their measures in this place. So it, it, it actually manages risk and uh, through self-regulation, we, we avoid uh, what can sometimes be the heavy-handed nature of government regulations. And the final thing to say is that uh, it's not necessary to uh, operate international programs and projects uh, in development uh, belonging to ACFID or being a signatory to our code. Uh, many organisations do not. However, 80% of the funds that are raised annually each year for international development activities, uh, according to st statistical surveys, uh, show that they go through ACFID members. Uh, so that indicates that an industry standard uh, is actually very val valuable and organisations value the learning 
uh, that they can acquire from each other in in joining the the ACFID code and becoming uh, compliant with it. And as you can see, over time, it's evolved through those five year reviews. So uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. But now over to my colleagues to just give a little bit more background to why we're having the review, what the process has been. Over to you, Jocelyn M. Thanks, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see so many uh, familiar names but less familiar faces, I guess, uh, in this afternoon's call. It's wonderful to have you with us um, and hope that you get a lot out of our presentation this afternoon. Um, Ems asked me to just give you a bit of background on sort of what we've been doing to date and what we set out to do originally with this review. Uh, and overall, we set our purpose, as um, as Mark alluded to, I think quite well there, ensuring that our code is relevant, that it makes sense to the people that engage with it, that our members um, and the wider stakeholder community find it to be useful, um, and that it really maintains that credibility as the, as the standard um, for international development. And so that's sort of where we've been focused for uh, almost 18 months now. And then since then, we've sort of broken that down uh, into a series of, series of objectives, I guess that's the underneath that. Um, and uh, we want to make sure um, that this is, a, this is a really good chance for a comprehensive review, that we only get this chance once in every five years, that we're really making sure that the code is relevant in light of um, all of the things that change in, both in our role as INGOs um, and also in the practices and what we define as good practice um, across our community more broadly. And we know that there has been lots of changes in that space, even just in the last five years, and we'll touch on some of those this afternoon. Um, Things, things do change all the time and that uh, often creates gaps in what we're asking members to do. Um, and so we've tried to address some of those specifically via this review, but we've also tried to remain really focused on making sure that compliance is manageable. So really not making changes to the code unless they're absolutely necessary, not changing things just because uh, it's convenient for us, but also that it's that it makes sense to our members as well. Um, and that if we are adding new requirements that we're also taking the opportunity to remove some as well. And that will come up this afternoon as well. Um, we looked at redundancy, we looked at overlap and we wanted to clarify requirements where we uh, where we found since the last review, which was really comprehensive, um, that there might've been some things that were ambiguous in practice or that we thought we could specify a little bit more what it was we're actually after. We wanted to make sure we're well aligned with international self-regulation and also with some of the other sort of key self-regulatory and external regulatory policies and standards that our members work within in terms of the broader environment. Um, and so we'll, we'll cover that in some detail this afternoon as well. Um, and then we just more generally um, were aiming to update the guidance and resources that we provide throughout to our members, um, which we've had the opportunity to do too. Uh, so, like we sort of alluded to before, um, this review has been underway um, since April last year. So we've done we've done some planning, we've done some preparation for it. Um, we've done quite a lot of, I guess, initial consultation, which is what that red line there is referring to, where we were talking to members, I guess, at sort of a higher, more thematic level about what types of changes overall they thought were important for us to focus on via this review. And then since the end of last year, um, the beginning of this year, we've been really focused on consulting on drafting up those changes and what they actually look like um, in practice and really being very deliberate in consulting with our members on those. And you can see that now sort of since, since mid-June, um, we have been talking about this final version. Um, so we're right here uh, at that um, almost at this at this red arrow, which is the Ackford Council on 18 October um, of this year, where we're really looking um, at everything um, and asking members to endorse our final version of the code, um, which is something we'll talk about this afternoon as well. 
And so in terms of the resolutions that we will put to ACFID members um, on the afternoon of the 18th of October uh, in Sydney, there's going to be two resolutions. So one thing that we'll ask our members to do is to approve this amended ACFID Code of Conduct. Um, and we have sent all of the details of these changes out to our members um, with 60 days notice so we're required to do. And that is document B of the package um, if it happens to come across your desk. Um, so we're going to ask all of our members to approve the code. We cannot change it without our members' approval. Um, and that will be a really important moment, obviously, as part of this review. And then the second one is that we'll ask our members to endorse the separate but linked quality assurance framework, um, which we will also uh, seek your broader endorsement of as that's um, since the last comprehensive review of the code of conduct is a, now exists as a separate document that sort of sets out the verification framework for the code um, that's owned by the CCC. So in terms of what we've been doing to get to this phase, um, there's a bit of a snapshot there of all of the different ways um, and opportunities that our members have had to participate uh, in all different types of workshops since the start of this year. Uh, we feel quite confident at this point in the process that we have um, really sort of canvassed the spread of the different types of members that ACFID represents and that people have had the opportunity to attend at least one of those workshops, maybe more if there's something technical or specific that concerned their agency, um, that we, we went out for written feedback via surveys and email requests. We did one-to-one -one briefings with our members where they had a specific issue that they wanted to talk about. And we also really made excellent use um, of our wonderful communities of practice um, who were able to provide really specialist advice on some of the topics that we were interested in, in as part of this review process. And you can see some of them um, set out there. And then on this next slide, we've just got um, a list then of all of the committees, as well as some of the really important external stakeholders that we were able to touch base with via this process. So um, we've held workshops with the Committee for Development Cooperation, which is the collaborative body between um, DFAT and NGOs um, surrounding their ANCP accreditation process in particular, which might be relevant to your organisations. We've consulted with DFAT staff directly um, and through our regular partnership discussions. Um, we've had the chance to meet the Pacific Island Association of NGOs and talk to them about what their organisations believe is important, the, the Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, as well as some other standards um, and sort of technical experts in this area. And overall, um, it's been a really wonderful experience, as you can imagine, coming out of COVID, the chance to be able to actually get out uh, into Sydney and Melbourne and all kinds of places to talk to our members has been really rewarding overall. But it was also really nice to hear that um, the new, I guess, what is a relatively new structure and format for the code, having the quality assurance framework really setting out that detail, as well as the the um, quality principles and commitments approach is something that um, members felt was really working for them um, and that they could understand it and grab it and that um, that was something that they were keen to maintain. That was really good. Um, we were really, really pleased that overall, I guess, the intent of refreshing the code and aspiring to do better where we can is something that's broadly supported by all of our members. Um, and even that in some cases they were pushing us um, to, to do a little bit more than we were initially suggesting, which is always a really interesting um, and happy position for us to be in. Um, we heard some really nice feedback that the code is like a tool to open conversations, that it can be a lever for change and a framework for difficult conversations as well, which we thought, thought was really interesting. Um, and also that broadly our members find ACFID to be useful and supportive. And that's always nice for us to hear as well. Um, I might hand over to you, Em, because I know you've got lots more detail to share. Sure. Thanks, Josh. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, so what we're going to do now is just go through a bit of a summary of the actual amendments um, that are being made. Um, I'm going to fly through this reasonably quickly because um, there's a lot to cover. So if you do have specific questions on some of the um, individual changes or you want clarification on certain bits, please feel free to um, pop these in the chat as you go if you think of them. Um, otherwise, we will have time at the end for questions. Um, and I'll also speak a little bit to the actual implementation timeframes and so on that will be um, accompanying the rollout um, if the, the changes are passed at Council. So just to start off with, I guess, um, just to say that I guess overall most of the code and its accompanying 
quality assurance framework is remaining the same. So we are making some really exciting changes. Um, but in terms of the code itself, its overall purpose, objectives, the values, how it's structured, how it's set up in the architecture, and the compliance mechanisms that go along with it, um, these are not changing as part of this review. So where we are seeing amendments are to the actual content of both the sort of quality principles all the way down to the, the commitments and how you demonstrate that through through the indicators and verifiers in the code. Um, and these are to a, to a select few of them. Um, as Joss said, we have done some work. We have removed a couple of commitments and consolidated um, a few together as well. Um, so it's really at that content level where the changes have been made. The amendments themselves overall are based on a series of recommendations that came out of that initial consultation phase last year. So broadly, they cover um, three areas that you can see here. So around how can we actually increase the alignment with the code with other standards and regulations? Um, what are the key emerging issues that we really want to make sure are strengthened in the code? And also, what are the opportunities to maybe clean up and remove some duplication, improve clarity and consistency of language and terminology as well? So we're going to go through through each of each of these in a bit more detail. So in terms of alignment with other standards, um, so the, the code itself is actually informed by and also then informs other global and national standards and regulations um, that are relevant to ACTIS members. So wherever it's relevant and possible, the code has sought to align with those standards, mainly to reduce inconsistencies for members. So throughout all of the consultation, um, different processes that we've held, this was an area that we received um, probably the most feedback on um, and something that was really um, at the forefront of members' minds. So in doing so, we've looked at quite a few different standards, including DFAT, ACNC, core humanitarian standard um, legislation, including whistleblowing legislation, accounting standards, and so on. So quite a few, and others that in the end um, didn't result in any changes, but we did review them as well. So we've really focused our review on aligning the code with external regulation that's either required of all ACTID members, such as ACNC, um, or where the standards are really well established and there's already close alignment. And that's particularly in the case of DFAT accreditation as well. Um, and that was probably the one that members called out the most. So in terms of what's actually changing within the code. So if we start with ACNC, um, of course, just to note that ACFID members are already required to meet ACNC um, standards. So the aim with this is, is not to duplicate the ACNC standards in the code, but really to try and reduce the risk of um, contradiction with the ACNC and also to reduce the need for members to, to cross-reference between the code um, and ACNC standards when doing their code reporting and so on. So um, we're confident that what's in the code now is reflective of what you're already required to do as part of ACNC requirements. So we've updated a few things, particularly I'll highlight the one in the middle there around record keeping. Um, this was original, like in the current code is not something that's called out. So members will be required to have, have the records that they um, need that will give them the information necessary to let them prepare a summary of activities and expenditure. So again, these are all existing requirements, but they have been pulled into the code for that consistency for members. In terms of DFAT, um, we do, we did, we were really conscious that, um, you know, more than half of AFID members aren't DFAT accredited um, and many don't aspire to be. Um, and so therefore shouldn't be required to be bound by additional DFAT specific requirements, where these really significantly change what's already required in the code. Um, so for this reason, the amendments around DFAT requirements um, have really been done where DFAT's requirements are well established, where the code's already really close in alignment, but maybe the language terminology is a bit different, um, and where we think that actually increasing the alignment could reduce the overall sort of compliance burden and requirements for members who are DFAT accredited. So you'll see there's quite a few different things here. Um, a couple of things around having organisation-wide risk management approaches. 
So the code at the moment looks at risk in all manner of different ways. But this is focused more on an overarching sort of organizational strategic risk management approach. Um, and I, I'm sure many of your organizations do this already, whether you're DFAT accredited or not. Um, but a few other things in there, particularly around um, managing partnerships, looking at making sure you have shared understanding of responsibilities in your partnership agreements, um, making sure as part of your due diligence that you're assessing your partner's authority to work in relevant contexts. Um, and then a couple of things around sort of making sure people are, are actually acknowledging and signing codes of conduct. So this is really at the, the nitty gritty operational level where these changes are, are being made. A few other things in terms of DFAT around child safeguarding in particular. Um, so this might be an area where you might want to review your policies and procedures. Um, at the moment, particularly around reporting procedures, um, the code takes a very principled approach and um, the changes that are being brought into effect now are a bit more specific about what you should cover in a reporting procedure, things like just how to report, who to report to, what roles and responsibilities are and so on. So it's a bit more um, yeah, specific in terms of what needs to be covered there. And likewise, in looking at kind of codes of conduct, making sure that it's being signed and acknowledged. In terms of um, other legislation, so um, the code already has existing whistleblowing policy requirements. So these have now been updated to provide, um, I guess, greater clarity for members and to make sure that the code is aligned with the current legislation that is in place. So there were some updates that have been made since the last review of the code. Um, and so these, these updates that you're seeing there um, are specifically in response to those legislative requirements and also reflect ACNC guidance as well. So um, this might be a, an existing policy that you might need to review um, and also it will be um, made available on your website as well. And finally, in terms of alignment with other standards, there, there have been some minor updates and we just wanted to flag this for you in terms of the financial reporting templates. Um, so obviously we'll provide updated templates and more information to your organisations um, very soon, but there have been some um, little changes there in terms of what's included on the balance sheet. And these are reflective of the fact that the Australian accounting standards have changed slightly um, and also the ACNC guidance has been updated since the last review. So in terms of how we're going to support members around these changes, um, we have some, as, as Mark and others have alluded to, some really good um, mapping that already exists around ACCADS, code and other external standards. So we will be doing a lot of um, updating of existing tools and resources that are already out there. We're um, staying very much engaged with DFAT um, around these amendments and also the ACNC, making sure that they're up to date um, and know what's happening in this space and looking at creating some really quick guides that are um, practical tools for your organisation to take and see exactly where the changes have been made and what you might need to be thinking about um, as a response. So moving on to some of the more kind of um, thematic areas now. So one of the key issues that has come out of the review is really strengthening the code around its um, how it speaks about climate change. So it's obviously climate change is a global issue that's already impacting and is going to keep impacting the work of our members um, and also the communities and organisations um, that we work with. So this was identified in the consultations as, as a really critical issue. Um, but at the same time, um, people did recognise that not all members work in the area of environment and climate change. Um, but did note that the impacts of climate change will be widespread and will be affecting everyone. So the amendments that have come up here um, are building on um, active council resolutions from 2021 and also a lot of work that we've done in the last couple of years to develop a climate action framework. So just to say up front that the changes that are being proposed here are not going to require all active members to engage in climate change programs. Um, that's not what we're after. So where we where the changes are focused is on 
making sure that um, ACFID members have an organisational commitment to climate action, similar to what you are already required to have around the broader environmental sustainability, um, as well as then looking at how your organisation considers risks associated with climate change. Um, so this is both around your environmental risk management, specifically in your sort of programming work, but also to your general organisational risks and, um, you know, looking ahead, what, what could be the potential impacts of climate change on the communities and the ways in which you're working. So members are also going to be um, required to think about um, climate change from a sort of internal organisational perspective. Um, and have a commitment to minimising the carbon footprint of your organisation. So this is not a requirement that you will have to measure numerically um, the carbon footprint of your organisation or report on that publicly. But what we are asking members to do is to think about what are some ways that you can try to minimise your carbon footprint as part of your broader organisational commitments that you already have. Um, and we will be developing and, and sharing tools that would help, will help you do that as well. Um, and lastly, to consider the impacts of climate change when actually trying to understand the context in which you're working um, and when you're planning and sort of designing your program, how, how can you incorporate climate change into that process? And similarly, in terms of climate change, so within the code, we have something called good practice indicators. So these describe a higher standard of practice than what's just set out in the compliance indicators. So these aren't required for compliance and members can work towards these over time. So these are um, more aspirational in, in some ways. So as part of the code review, there are quite a few um, new places that good practice indicators have been used as a way of introducing things into the code, but they're not required of members. Um, so you can see here some of the new good practice indicators which members will be encouraged to do. Um, these do include things like reporting on what you're doing to reduce your carbon footprint, having organisational targets, taking a climate justice and equity approach to your climate change work, um, and making sure or trying to incorporate climate change into your program strategies where possible. So those are, are the, the good practice indicators members might aspire to. In terms of support around climate change, um, this has been a big piece of work for ACFID for a couple of years now. So we're just building on what we've already done um, so far. So we do have a climate change resource hub that's freely available on Learn with ACFID. So we will be looking at expanding that with resources specifically focused on some of the code changes. Um, there's a climate change policy and practice community, which is very active, um, allowing members to get together to share um, reflections and learnings from each other. We will be kicking off a peer-to-peer -peer learning program, um, which is a, a bit more of a structured way for our members to support each other and learn from each other. So if this is something that your organisation is hoping to, to strengthen or would like to just um, you know, learn from others what they are doing, please reach out to us um, and we can speak more to you about that. We've also just generally updating guidance in reflection of the code changes too. All right, so locally led development and humanitarian action was another really big issue that's come out of this review. Um, and again, this sort of builds on both global commitments that a lot of our members have already signed up to around the grand bargain, um, commitments in the OECD DAC as well, around sort of supporting local civil society. And a lot of our members um, are already doing a lot of work in this space. And it was felt that um, while the code already supports locally led development in, in many ways, there were ways to strengthen it and make it um, articulate that better um, within the current wording. So it builds on some resolutions from 2022 um, and overall, there's been really strong support for the sort of intent and aspirations of these amendments. Um, and lots of members do see themselves working in this way already, which is fantastic. So um, these have been some really rich and fruitful discussions throughout, throughout the review process. So what's changing in this space? Again, we sort of focused on an organisational um, commitment to locally led action. 
Um, and this allows your organization um, to determine itself what is it that are your priorities in moving towards having more locally led um, programming and ways of working as well. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion throughout the review about the role of sort of power um, and how different power relationships between both um, active members and their partners and other players within um, the development space um, influence how, how work is done. Um, so that has been incorporated here into sort of um, asking organisations to, to name and be explicit um, and then address sort of um, what those imbalances are in the ways that are, are possible for them. Um, there's also a real focus on making sure that the voice and decision making of local actors is really um, evident in all stages of programs and in how resources are allocated. So it's not necessarily just a consultation at the start of a program, but what's that ongoing engagement and, and conversation that you have with those who are um, most closely affected by the work that you do. There are also, there are quite a few things here. I won't go through them all, but just to say that some of these um, are current good practice indicators, which members wanted to see elevated up into the code and become requirements. So those are things like having regular partnership meetings where you have open feedback and dialogue, um, making sure that your public materials reflect the perspectives of, of primary stakeholders, those you work with and for. Um, so a lot of, um, a lot of these things your organization might already be doing. But one that I will flag is the second one there from the bottom. And this is um, quite a shift, I guess, in the way that the code is currently talking about how you manage risk with your partners um, that you work with. So at the moment within the code, as you might know, there's quite a few requirements which you have to um, cascade to your partners. Um, and you're required to do this through an MOU or similar. So through the consultation process, members really said, we want more flexibility in how, how we do this. It doesn't, you know, having an MOU is not always the most effective way to do this for us um, and with the different types of partners that we have. So a big change, I guess, in some ways has been to, to change that. So quite a few um, indicators and verifiers now where you are working with partners on high risk areas like safeguarding, counterterrorism, financing, you need to make sure you have appropriate mechanisms in place to assess, manage and mitigate the risks. And so this will look very different maybe for different organisations and depending on who your partners are. Um, and it's up to your organisation to figure out what it is that will give you the assurance um, that you're managing the risks then with your partners. And finally, members um, will be encouraged, so a good practice indicator, to collaborate with other INGOs and donors um, to reduce the resources that local partners um, are required to, to use to actually manage compliance obligations. So that could be, um, you know, looking at what other due diligence has already been done um, by other donors and partners um, or working kind of more in a consortium approach as well. So in terms of support here, um, we are really focused at the moment on a big piece of work we're excited about in terms of developing a locally led action framework. Um, so this is going to be uh, a suite of tools that are really practical and hopefully simple to use um, to help your organization have some of those conversations um, internally and with your partners about what it means for you to become more locally led. Um, so it will, um, share some information about um, what that could look like um, and give you some practical tools to have those conversations um, and do some planning as well. So we're hoping to collect case studies um, from members as well. Um, so if you do have um, things to share, please keep an eye out for that um, as we'd love some member case studies. We're also looking at um, forming a locally led action community of practice going forward. Um, and again, sort of updating just generally the guidance that we have online for members. In terms of um, another emerging issue, anti-racism, racial justice and diversity. Um, so back in 2020, ACID members affirmed their commitment to building greater representation, participation and access to decision making with people of varied cultural and racial origins and intersections in the sector. Um, 
So this was something, again, that came through really strongly in the consultation. So people wanted to explicitly address sort of um, the power structures within our own organisations, diversity of workforces, leadership, governance bodies. Um, and so both representation and reporting were seen as ways that we could um, highlight and build diversity in governance um, and personnel. However, in this space, a lot of members did note that um, mandatory requirements might not be feasible and could be quite burdensome for some um, smaller agencies in particular at this time. And so many of the amendments have been introduced as good practice indicators um, in this space. So members um, will be asked to have an organisational commitment to the pursuit of racial justice. And again, this sits at sort of that policy statement level. Um, in terms of more um, practice, we'll be looking at things like having um, training available to um, governing body, senior leadership, as well as staff and volunteers around diversity and anti-racism, um, making sure human resource policies cover um, anti-racism as well as other issues around diversity, and include reference to anti-racism in organisational codes of conduct. So again, with all of these changes, we'll be providing examples and advice on what this could look like. Um, we recognise that, you know, there's a real diversity of active members. Um, and so trying to share some examples that might um, reflect what some different organisations are already doing um, or would like to do as well. Um, in terms of what members will be encouraged to do, um, this is where we're focused on looking at diversity and representation, both at your um, governance level and also in your staff and volunteers, and then that reporting publicly on that. Um, and a, a really interesting one that came up as well was around sort of um, periodically assessing the cultural safety of your organisation. And that's slightly different from um, just kind of um, doing a diversity profile as well of your organisation. So in terms of support for members here, again, through Learn with Ackford, we do have an extensive um, racial justice resource hub that's just about to be launched. Um, so please keep your eyes out for that. This is something that you would like more support on. Um, we have been providing through Ackford, I hope some of you have been able to join um, some really fantastic training workshops already. So we will be looking in the future if there's other opportunities to support members with, with training in this space. Um, and we do have also a community of practice that meets regularly. Um, and again, we'll update some of our general guidance. So to our final um, thematic area that's emerged out of this review is to do with the misconduct disclosure scheme. Um, so this is a specific scheme um, that at the moment is operating um, based out of, out of the UK or in Europe. And um, several ACWID members are already part of this. But the misconduct disclosure um, scheme, if you remember, um, for those of you who've been in the sector a little while, back in 2018, um, ACWID and our members commissioned an independent review into sexual misconduct in our sector, um, which, was, which was conducted, I think, by the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. Um, and there were several recommendations from that. And one of them was related to um, ways that we can prevent the movement of um, known sexual abusers or perpetrators moving between organisations undetected. Um, and so this can sometimes happen prior to um, a full investigation happening or before criminal charges and so on are laid. Um, so this, um, this recommendation is specifically in response um, to that review and some of the recommendations coming out of it. So the scheme itself um, complements other processes that your organisation might already have in place. Um, and we'd be very happy to, to speak more about what's actually involved in being part of the scheme, um, maybe in the Q&A if, it, if it's relevant for your organisation. Um, but essentially it involves a series of um, HR checks from organisation to organisation, um, both at the time of recruitment and also um, for an, when another organisation is looking to recruit someone who's worked with you in the past. So in terms of the actual changes to the code, um, the way that this has fallen out after um, quite a few discussions um, and briefings with members 
is that the area of greatest risk that we see is for organisations that are engaged in humanitarian responses, um, and particularly those who deploy personnel um, for humanitarian initiatives. So in terms of the code changes, um, if your organisation deploys personnel for humanitarian initiatives, um, you will be required to participate in the misconduct disclosure scheme. Um, it's, it's free to sign up and everything, but it's the existing scheme at the moment that's really um, got the most promise. So all other members will be encouraged to participate in the misconduct disclosure scheme. Um, and we do, we do have members already who are participating. In terms of support for members, we recognise that um, this um, has been a, a change that's required quite a lot of thinking and what it looks like in, in practicality for members. Um, so ACRID has commissioned some um, legal guidance, which is available for members. If you would like to receive this for your organisation, um, please get in touch with us. We've also pulled together some, just some frequently asked questions and sort of guidance on, implement, on implementing the scheme and what this might um, actually look like and mean for your organisation. Um, and in terms of sort of looking ahead, um, we do think having it in the code gives us the, um, we're, we're able then, I guess, to reach out to other players like DFAT and the managing contractors around, is there other ways that we can support members going forward to create kind of centralised investigation capacity or shared tools and templates and so on um, that would really kind of bring that um, efficiency of scale um, and help us kind of make the most of having having members participating in the scheme. And finally in terms of the changes we have made a, a suite of changes um, which relate to sort of again making sure that language and terminology is clear and consistent across the code making sure that the definitions that are in there um, reflect current practice and make sense for people. We've removed some duplication. As I said, we've sort of consolidated a couple of, um, of the commitments as well as some of the different verifiers in some spots. Um, and most of the changes, at least related to this section, um, are updates to wordings and terminology don't necessarily have a material impact on your reporting against the code and so on, um, what you need to do there. We will be, as I said, you know, updating all of our tools and templates and so on to help you prepare your reporting um, and to share with you sort of where those updated terminology um, changes have been made as well. All right, so that's a rapid fire sort of <laughs> um, summary of all of the changes. I recognise it's a lot to take in. Um, and all of that information and detail is outlined in the papers that have been shared with you for the AGM um, in the background and rationale document. So if you want to go back and take a look, um, it should all be in there. So in terms of actually implementation of the amendments, um, so the amendments, assuming they are passed at Ackford Council, um, are planned to then come into effect on the 30th of June next year in 2024. Um, as with the usual process, all members would then submit reporting to Ackford five months after your financial year end. So that's what, what happens now and that would still be the same process. So you can see what your reporting dates would be in the, in the table on the side there. So if your organisation has a financial year end of the 30th of June next year, you will be the, the first cohort to report under the revised code. Our existing three yearly cycle will continue. Um, so you'll do a code self-assessment followed by two exceptions reports. So wherever you are in the cycle of the, those three years at the moment, you would just continue on that same cycle. And we will be providing plenty of upfront information so that you are aware of whether you need to do a code self-assessment or um, an exceptions report. And as with the current policy around the code, um, you know, we take a really educative approach and want to work with your organisation to help you meet compliance with the code. Um, you will have 12 months to remedy any areas of non-compliance that are identified through the self-assessment process. Um, so essentially, you, you would get a further year to, to make sure you have implemented the changes. And just to note that any complaints will be assessed against the version of the code that's actually in place at the time that those um, that complaint is triggered. Um, so obviously if it happened 
during a transition period in the middle of next year, the CCC, who manages the independent complaints mechanism, would take that into account as well. And so finally, just to show you what we've got, what we're thinking in terms of some member information forums. So we are planning to have a session focused more for the code um, compliance contacts within your organisation um, in November this year, um, assuming all the changes go through. We will be working a lot on updating the resources, um, guidance and so on over the next sort of six to eight months um, and hoping to do a bit of a code roadshow um, and come out and meet you and, and your staff and volunteers um, probably in sort of March, April of next year as well. Um, so quite a lot of opportunity to, to get together and sort of um, provide some learning opportunities as well as part of that around some of those thematic areas. Um, and then, yeah, looking ahead um, at the code coming into effect and launching it in the middle of next year. So I will pause there now. Um, it's a lot to take in, I appreciate, but I'm going to hand it back to you, Joss, to, to run us through a bit of a question time. Thanks, Em, um, and thanks everybody for your attention. It, it is a lot of information to take on, but it's hard to leave anything out because we really want to get uh, everybody across all of the changes as they are really important for how we move forward and into the reporting cycle and onwards from there. But we still do have a few minutes left in our time together this afternoon. So we really just wanted to open the floor to you to see if there's particular things that you wanted to ask us about this afternoon. Um, feel free to pop up your hand or pop your questions into the chat uh, as Mark suggested there. Um, so I might just pause there and see if there's something burning on your mind at present. Cameron. Thanks, Jocelyn, and thanks, Ackford. Well, well done. Clearly an incredible piece of work and, you know, the code, whilst I won't go into every detail, it, it makes sense and certainly looking forward to it going forward. Just two quick things, if I can. Firstly, the code change, if you like, is perhaps the most significant thing that's been put to the council for some time, yet the council meeting for this year is proposed to be an in-person meeting only. Um, and I perhaps would just urge Ackford's board and broader membership to consider making that a hybrid meeting because I think a lot of people would want to publicly acknowledge DFAT and the work that's being done here. And I think having it only in person is problematic, especially for some smaller agencies. So take that as a comment if you can um the other the other thing if i can just on some of the good practice indicators uh, i would perhaps also just encourage dfat uh, sorry ackford sorry <laughs> uh ackford to think about how we message that publicly in that whilst they are good practice indicators none of us work in isolation donors don't look at one organization and not look at others and I think, again, for smaller and mid-sized organisations, it will take time to address some of those good practice indicators. And I think if we could have a way that nuances that they are, in fact, very different from code compliance, uh, because I think, you know, the average donor doesn't necessarily see the difference between, you know, nice to have and must have. And I think that's something that, as a sector, we need to get better at doing. Uh, but I... Thanks, and again, well done on the work. It looks great. Thanks, Cameron. Um, that's really constructive and really useful feedback on both your points. Um, we'll certainly take that on board with regards to the good practice indicators. It is how we publicly message all aspects of the code, frankly, are things that we're really interested in, he in hearing feedback on. And like you say, I think it's apparent to our, us and our members that you good practice indicators are a progression that we work through. Um, and we have had the opportunity as part of this review to fold some of the existing good practice indicators that our members were meeting into the code as well, which is a nice proof of concept. Um, but yes, we'll take that on board and think about it. Thank you. Um, I didn't know whether you were aware of a particular reason, Mark. I'm not off the top of my head why our AGM is not hybrid. It could be a constitutional thing. I'll, um, 
I, we've received your email on this, Cam, and our business manager has looked at it. I think um, at this point, it's simply because it's our first face-to-face -face meeting in three years. Uh, 60% of our members are in Sydney where it's it's uh, occurring. And I think uh, they were keen to try and get everyone in the room, um, but I don't know whether they've um, whether they've gone ahead and tried to see if they can make the, uh, the presentations work virtually, but I'll, I'll try and find out. I think voting becomes, um, they wanted to sort of try and do it by by show of hands again, like they, they have done in face-to-faces -face in the past. And when you start bringing in virtual and face-to-faces, -face, that starts getting quite complicated. Thanks, Mark. Uh, look, as, as I said in there, Mark, if, if we can do it, it'd be great. But if we can't, you know, yeah. I'll be a reluctant apology. Okay. Thanks, Kev. Um, and just to emphasise as well that uh, the we do have um, a limited number of supporter places for small members that are struggling to attend the conference. So if that is your organisation, please do get in touch with us directly. Um, we always need to hear about the kinds of constraints you're facing and um, we do our best to work with you as well. Um, are there other questions or comments that feedback that people have for us this afternoon? Well, do feel free to take your time to digest everything you've heard this afternoon. Um, like Em sort of said at the start, uh, all of the detail of the changes has come out in the AGM package. It's also available online on our website. You can just go and click on Code of Conduct and one of the first options is the Code Review um, and you'll find uh, online versions in case you've misplaced yours in what I'm sure are very busy inboxes. Um, and do feel free to get in touch if you are reading those in more detail and you think that something doesn't quite make sense uh, or you'd like to know more about it, um, we'd love to hear from you. I think we've got a couple of contact details just in case you need anything. Um, so if you have questions that are specific to the AGM and how it will run, um, that, those should be directed towards our business director. Um, she's also the returning officer for the elections. Um, so if you're considering those, any of those positions, um, do check your inbox for details about those. And I believe there's another email coming out this week just to remind everybody um, that we're getting close to 30 days uh, from the AGM, which is, of course, very exciting um, as it's also very close to ACFID conference. Um, if you have questions that are specific to the code amendments, feel free to get in touch with M. Um, and we have hosted, but will continue to host a number of sessions that are sort of more, I guess, more processy about how our reporting systems work. We know that we, and probably you do as well, that we have changed um, our system that we're using to receive your reporting. Uh, and that does mean a few small changes for you in terms of how you are sort of authorised sign-offs um, and submissions through there. So if you have specific questions, um, do reach out, but otherwise keep an eye out for more opportunities to engage with those uh, as well. I'm not sure if we have anything else for you in that case then, Em, other than to say thanks very much um, for joining us. Um, and if others have anything to add, please jump in. No. All right. Well, um, I know it's Monday afternoon, so you're probably very, very keen to get back to uh, all of the other things um, that you have to do in your day. Um, and just a reminder that we'd love to have you uh, register for ACFID conference, as well as the AGM, if you're available. Um, our theme this year uh, is Global Development 2.0. Um, it's all about the disruptive dynamics of our sector, um, which you'll note the code is trying to respond to in some parts, and I'm sure you're aware of many, many more changes happening around the world as we speak. Um, we're really, really looking forward to, as Mark said, to having everybody back together face to face. Um, it's a really uh, nice opportunity for us all this year. And um, Em's pop some links into the chat for where you can find out more about our program and how to register. Um, otherwise, we'll let you um, be on your way. Thanks so much for coming along. It was really lovely to see you all. Thanks, everyone.